Now, it is just I will straight away go to the definitions because it is very important to understand the definition of the resistant hypertension. What we mean by resistant hypertension as defined by the American and European societies is the compliance with the maximum doses of at least three hypertensive medications from three different classes and one of them should be the diuretic. And um, of course we have to rule out the reversible causes and if the patient's blood pressure is not be controlled on more than three drugs, that means patient will be requiring four drugs. So if the blood pressure is controlled on four drugs, then we call it as a controlled resistant hypertension. On the other hand, if the blood pressure is not being controlled by the four or more medications, including diuretic and including spironolactone, then we label that as a refractory hypertension. Now, the incidence and prevalence of refractory hypertension has been increasing for the last two, three decades, despite the availability of so many uh, drugs and the, it's more because of the awareness of the, the disease and the problem itself. Now, the general prevalence I mentioned is quite low in the um, general population around, you know, general population is very low, but in a specialized clinics you can have around 10 to 15 percent of the patients will be labeled as a resistant hypertension and in clinical trials the, the the, the control was uh, the more difficult and the incidence was much more in the clinical trials. Now, we all know the importance of blood pressure reduction because we know that even the blood pressure reduction of 10 millimeters of mercury is associated with 20% decrease in the cardiovascular events and 17% decrease in coronary artery disease. Similarly, around 27 and 28% reduction in the stroke, heart failure and out cause mortality. But we should also understand that each 20 millimeter systolic blood pressure and 10 millimeter diastolic blood pressure rise is associated with doubling of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the cardi overall cardiovascular uh, mortalities. You can understand. The, the, the other thing is, so therefore, there's no surprise that the incidence of the overall, the, the cardiovascular events are much higher in patients with resistant hypertension and, the, and the, as well as the refractory hypertension. And in fact, the disease, the, the cardiovascular free, you know, the event free survival, the event free survival in those patients who have got a, a controlled hypertension uh, is less as compared to the, those patients who have got a refractory or a resistant hypertension. Now, then it is very, very important to differentiate what we mean by actually the, uh, the refractory or resistant apparition because there's, there's a large group of the patients who we label as a pseudo resistance. And we, when we talk about the pseudo resistance, we are talking about the blood pressure technique, we are talking about the adherence, we are talking about the white coat effect, as well as the lack of understanding of the treatment. So let us just elaborate. Now, when we talk about the poor technique, you know, you know, if you go through the guidelines, if you see, it's so important to label a person hypertension, but there are certain set parameters where before you label your patient as hypertensive. And of course, you have to properly measure the, 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 the instrument has to be uh, particularly, um, you know, cuff size and then the position of the patient is very, very important. Similarly, the environment in which blood pressure is being taken is also very, very important. Because, you know, when you label a person is hypertensive, it becomes, a, it is a lifelong disease. So just to, at least the beginning of the diagnosis, it's very, very important how to really correctly measure. Now, this problem, although it was much more with the, the, the older thermo, the older sigma manometers when the mercury was being used. Nowadays, with the new, new computerized aneroid uh, blood pressure, sometimes this is less marked, but overall the environment is very, very important and some of the position of the patient is of course makes a huge difference between, you know, because it's a, it's, a, it's a game of the numbers. So therefore, you have to be very sure what we are talking about. We all know about the white coat effect because around 30% of your patient may have element of a white coat effect. And the base way to rule out this white coat effect is to have a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, in fact, which is a very set standard for, for, for many of the patients whom blood pressure is not being controlled. So this is also an important aspect before we label. They all come in pseudo-resistance. The, 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 the main important thing, I will be spending a few more minutes on adherence because this is a very, very common problem with our patients. Now, what we mean by adherence is basically it is the ability to take medications as prescribed by the doctors. And when we use the word persistence, means this ability to take the medicines regularly for a longer period of the time. So these are the two important terms one has to understand. And as far as the non-adherence is concerned, around it has been noticed that 50% of the patients generally 
discontinue the anti-hepatitis medications within one year. Now, the, the, although, you know, there are different ways how you can improve the, 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 the adherence, you know, the base way which, although, I mean, you can talk about the, the motivation of the patient and, and the, the financial aspects of the, all the things, but the, basically the main important thing is the simplification. The simplification of the dosing regime appears to be the most important intervention which physicians can do just to improve the adherence of these uh, blood pressure medications. Now, of course, adherence varies according to the different group of the, um, uh, the, the blood pressure medications, and of course, the, the newer ones, the ARVs and ACE inhibitors, they have got a very good uh, tolerability, and of course, the adherence is less uh, with the beta blockers and the diuretic therapy. Now, WHO basically identifies there are different five domains of when you are talking about the adherence. Of course, majority is socioeconomic. Now, especially I'm talking about the large world population where socioeconomic factors is a huge contributor to this poor adherence. I mean, young, normally the younger people and the very elderly people, these are the people who will have a more problem with the adherence. And especially the female patients also, sometimes their, their compliance is not good as compared to the male patients. Of course, it all depends upon your insurance and the education status. The second is important group is the patient related. Now, this is very, very important I want to highlight is that because, you know, they are the main person, they have to be given this direction. So, you have to understand whether your patient is able to take the medicines or not, whether he's readily taking, taking his medicines. And there are a lot of, lot of individual factors like forgetfulness, people have you know, fear of dependence, oh, doctor, it will be lifelong medications, and I will be get habitual of these medications. You no, know, there are different terms people try to excuse and bring excuses. And sometimes, you know, there's a denial of phenomena. They say, oh, I'm fit enough. How can I have any blood pressure? How can I have any medicine? Why should I be taking all these medicines? So these are very important patient-related factors. Um, the other thing is therapy related. Of course, the complexity of the treatment, complexity of the regime, the side effects of medications, and sometimes, you know, your patient may not have only one disease, there may be an element of polypharmacy also. So they have to take a large number of medicines. So therapy related element is there. Then combined effect, you know, the patient may have some associated comorbid conditions, as I told you, because for some blood pressure patient, 30 or 40 percent, they have diabetes, you know. So therefore, they may have depression, they may have psychiatric problems, you know. A lot of complications, a lot of medical medication, polypharmacy, this is very, very important contributory factor. And then mostly the healthcare system. What are the facilities available in the healthcare system, whether insurance covers or not, whether the hospital facilities are available, whether the patient is able to reach to the doctor or not. So these are the very important worldwide domains which are contributing to the poor adherence. Now, coming back to the patient again, why the patients, they have got a problem with the adherence? Because the patient thinks, you know, blood pressure is a silent disease. So it's asymptomatic disease. It is an uncurable disease. I tell, you know, we tell the patient that you have to live with this disease for a lifelong, you know. It's a chronic disease. And then the another important thing is because even the patient misses few doses, there is no symptom. So there's reason, you know, patients are tilted to go to for poor compliance. Similarly, the target organ damage, again, it is not necessarily being a symptomatic. Side effect of the drugs is another important, as I mentioned before, the cost combination, they are very, very important contributory factors. Complex disease of the regime, I mean, three, four times a day, I mean, as if the patient is getting polypharmacy, this is another important thing. And then multiple medications I mentioned. And then lack of understanding. I think this is, I will take the, being the doctors, we are immediately at fault because we need to highlight the importance of the long-term sequelae of these chronic medications. So therefore, I mean, generally we just patient take the patient, we take the medicine and go away, but it's not the things. Similarly, uh, sometimes we should say, okay, my blood pressure is now normal. So they stop the taking medication and they think the blood pressure is cured now. And then as I mentioned, there are social, economic and personal factors. But I think this is another important factor we have to understand. We physicians are also at fault. What is called a physician's inertia. First of all, we, we don't have time for the patients. We are not able to explain to the patients, okay, what are the reasons, what, what are the detailed education is not there. And similarly, we physicians may not be adhering to the guidelines. And then you may say, okay, every year there are different guidelines coming up. We cannot remember all the things. But again, this is an important factor for a physician's inertia. Sometimes we are also not good enough in prescribing the right dose at the right time. 
you know, there's the important factor. There's inertia also because sometimes we, we just keep a blind eye. Okay, blood pressure is slightly elevated. Oh, say the blood pressure will ask you, what is the blood pressure? The doctor will say, oh, it is a little bit high. Just relax, don't take, you know. So therefore, we are not really very, very keen to, to, to increase or escalate the medication therapy. So this is important. Now, I'm not going to tell all the pathophysiology, but this, is, this, this slide is very good because it is multifactorial. You know, blood pressure is, is multifactorial. At the core of the pathology is, of course, the, the sympathetic nervous system, and then we know there is a, this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. But there are, multi, there are important factors, because there are genetic factors. You know, there's a monogenic element is there, poly, polygenic elements is there, you know, in some of the patients. Then environmental factors, which we all know, it is the surrounding temperature, it's the, the working conditions, you know, noise even, pollution, noise exposure, and then lifestyle factors. Is the diet, alcohol, smoking, physical activity, sleep quality, stress, these are the all factors which are contributing to the blood pressure. And of course, then physiologically inside the body, we have got a different hormones. As I mentioned, the raw system is there, the sympathetic nervous system is there, then endothelial uh, the factor is now coming into the play, and a lot of new medications are coming to stop this endothelial role. And similarly, there are certain vasodilators inside the body, like nitric oxide, nitric peptide, prostacyclin. So this blood pressure is not a one thing. There's interplay of so many factors which are really giving rise to this num these numbers. Now again, if you go to the, the causes of secondary operation, because this is another comes into the causes, now, all the, if you see, the basically there are five different reasons how the secondary operation contribute to this thing. One is by causing the vascular tone, by second mechanism is by increasing sodium and water retention. Third one is increasing the sympathetic nervous system activity. And again, some of the uh, reasons is the RAS activation and endothelial nitric oxide mismatch. These are the important, in fact, all the secondary causes, they have got different mechanisms. And there are certain medication, long list of medication, the NSAIDs, the aspirins, the COX inhibitors, sympathetomimetic agents which are present in decongestants, the oral contrast is to pill, you know, the, the chemotherapies, uh, uh, you know, liquorized herbal medication, they are all contribute to the to the these medications. Now again, obesity, dietary sodium, I don't I'm not going to tell all this, but we know these are the important contributing factors to the to the blood pressure. So you don't need to take care and each one of these lifestyle factors, they've got a different way how they cause blood pressure, including the sleep apnea and alcohol. And we know the effects because if you control the lifestyle factors, including the weight reduction, the diet, the DASH diet, the physical activity, they can all have a variable effect of between 5 to 10 millimeter reduction can be attributed to if you control these uh, lifestyle factors. Now, the important factors is that sometimes we have noticed in clinical practice this is combining drugs from different classes is approximately five times more effective in lowering blood pressure than doubling the dose of a one particular medication. Now, as come to the coming to the medication, we all know there are first three lines drugs. Uh, either there is a diuretic therapy, which may be thiazide, non-thiazuric therapy, then we have got calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines, and then angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin um, enzyme con con in what, AC, angiotensin converting inhibitors. So these are the first line drug of the therapy. Then these studies, you know, these different trials like the aspirin trial and the um, uh, pathway trial, they confirm that the spiral electron has got a very efficacious role in controlling the blood pressure. So this you now recommendation guideline recommend the spiral electron should be a fourth line of the drug, you know. Now, then if you come to the fifth drugs which you are using, we have got a large number of the medication which can be used actually. And also beta blockers, in fact, the newer guidelines, especially the European guidelines, they are promoting back again the beta blockers as the third or fourth drug as compared to the fifth drug. So we have got beta blockers, we have got alpha blockers, we have got central sympathetolytics, direct vasodilators like hydralazine, minoxidil, and direct and inhibitors. So these are the drugs available as the fifth drug, which can use, you can use any of these drugs. But now the new drugs are coming up. And so there's a large list of the drugs coming up, endocellular receptor antagonists, etra. Now, aprocytinin, you know, this is just recently approved by FDA in, I think it's March or April this year. So this is the endothelial receptor antagonist. The other one also is being uh, coming in the group. Then we have got a small interfering RNA, serenotherapy. This is zilibacerin. This is a once weekly injection. 
it inhibits the, the, the development and in, in, it, it, I think, blocks the synthesis of the angiotensin converting enzyme. So, it is a long lasting effect, one week injections can be given. This is also again approved by the FDA recently. Then we have got aldosterone synthase inhibitors. Both drugs are in the market, they have finished their third phase. And then we have got NEP inhibitors, that is called neutral endopeptidase inhibitors. OMA petri related, again it is I think going to be approved very soon. And then we know this RNA inhibitors, we have been using it in heart failure. Basically this is heart failure drugs, which is, which is a combination of secubitril and valsartan. But nowadays, although it is a primarily heart failure drugs, which can be used even in a stage 3 and 4 heart failure, but it has definitely a high potency effect, but no, we are not using it as a primarily anti hepatitis medication. Then we have got now vaccination is coming up. You know, to our immunotherapy where you block permanently the, the development of the. So, these vaccinations are against renin, against angiotensin, against angiotensin 1, and against the AT receptor blockers. So, so time is changing, you know. Now, then coming to the newer therapies. Now, we have got a renal denervation. Now, this has been going on for the last two, three years, actually. Sorry, last two decades. And uh, we know because the renal have got sympathetic, you know, there are different pathways and different pathways, and this is how they work, you know. So, because if there is increased sympathetic activity is there, and the other end, there is any kidneys can cause proteinuria. And also, there's this basically slide shows that the role of sympathetic nervous system activity is there through the, which acts on the kidneys, and that is modulates the development of this uh, hypertension. So, therefore, there were different four trials. In fact, there was uh, dinner thin sympathy and simplicity. Now, one of the trial was in fact stopped because I didn't show any benefit. Simplicity hypertension 4 was again halted prematurely because of side effect. But nowadays, actually, there are different ways how can you, you can have a renal uh, denervation. You can have a catheter based renal uh, uh, you know, ablation, you can have ultrasound guided. In fact, recently in Russia's hospital, we have started doing the, through the ultrasound way, we can have a uh, you know, way of through the, the renal uh, sympathetic uh, denervation can be done. We have just started the Russia's hospital, you know. Then there's different other ways also. Cryoablation is, there is, there is hey, heat therapy is there. So, I, so, there are different mechanisms where you can block the renal uh, sympathetic pathways, uh, you know. The, the, and what are the guidelines? They say, guidelines they say that, you know, it can be considered as, a, as an option uh, in those patients who have got GFR of more than 40 if the blood pressure is not being controlled by the different combination of the drugs, you know. And similarly, it can be considered as an additional therapy in those patients who even when the, when the GFR is more than 40. But the problem here is, now this drug, this, this method is, is not pure, although it can help a lot, but most of these patients will still, they continue to require three or four drugs, you know. So this is just an additional tool which you can offer to the patients. So this perhaps won't be able to stop all medication. The reason is because, as I mentioned, there are different mechanisms for blood pressure in different pollution. The second thing which is uh, being, being brought up is the carotid sinus stimulation. There, there, so, what is, you know, there is a carotid barrel receptors here, reflexes here. They basically, physiologically, uh, it is autonomic nervous system. So, they, they increase, uh, they, so, you know, they modulate the autonomic tone by inhibiting the sympathetic cardiovascular drive and stimulating vagus nerve. So, basically, what happens is that this therapy attempts to normalize the imbalance between the sympathetic activity and the vagal activity. So, so this is where way you can block. And how they are doing it, basically, there is a receptor. There's, you know, it's, it's, it is being manipulated outside. So it's a catheter-based catheter second generation endovascular device where you can have a pulse generating and blocking the, the carotid bulb, you know, inside the carotid artery, you know, there's a carotid bulb there and you can have repeated stimulation causing that thing and blocking that thing. So this thing is being tried and, you know, but it's still not FDA approved. Then a uh, third one, people have gone a little bit beyond what they do to the central arteriovenous anastomosis. They are connecting the arterial system with the venous system. So, causing a bad, bad just like doing a, you know, we are doing for the, uh, you know, this dialysis. So, they are basically connecting the distal iliac vein with the distal iliac artery just to decrease the pressure in the arterial system. Again, uh, the, the, there were trials and they showed that it was a quite marked reduction. You can, can reduce up to 26 per millimeter of the mercury can be done by this, by this uh, surgical method. So just to summarize, you know, it's very, very important. 
first of all, we need to rule out the pseudo resistance. Okay, as I mentioned, there are different causes of pseudo resistance, and then second important again I will highlight is adherence, adherence because adherence is the important thing which is in our hand and which is patient hands. And as I mentioned, there's a long list of adherence factors, and we need to really sit down with the patient, educate the patient, not only the patient but the patient's family as well, because they have to be part and parcel of the uh, management, just like we are doing with the diabetes. The third thing is optimize the three drug regime. Again, you have to see if the patient taking right dose, right time, right drug combination is given. And then, you, you know, second, fourth step is to rule out the second hypertension is very, very important. Uh, then lifestyle barriers, because every patient has got a different lifestyle and there's a role of lifestyle definitely, you know. And then, um, and then you can, uh, as I mentioned, there are a long list of the drugs, fourth drugs, fifth drugs. We have a lot of varieties available for the fifth drugs, which can do. And then lastly, in the research centers, if nothing works, perhaps these are the patients. Very little population where we can think about the experiment, exper experimental uh, interventional therapy. But as I mentioned, maybe, maybe one or two percent patient might be requiring these things. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah.